CLC, so glad that you're joining us tonight as the body of Christ, whether we might be remote, but we are still one body, worshiping the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So we invite you right now to set aside everything else that's going on. Get your tablet, your phone, your screen, whatever it is that you're watching this service on right now. Get your family together, and let's go before the Lord in prayer and invite his presence to be felt in the room that you are right now. Jesus, we love you. And thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your love, your kindness. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you came to this earth to give us hope, refuge, and strength. Lord, to give us hope for eternity that we have in you, Jesus, regardless of what's going on right now in our life, Lord. We place our faith and our trust in you. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to worship you freely and to be able to hear your word and to study it. Lord, we ask that your will be done right now in this service. Let your will be done upon every home, upon every individual that's watching this service right now. Let us not watch, but let us be participants in the move of God that's happening right now upon our city and upon this country. Let your spirit reign right now upon every individual. Put away, Lord, any weight that so easily besets us. Lord Jesus, put away anything that distracts us from your will right now. We worship and exalt you, Jesus, for you are our Lord, our strength, our refuge. You are the one and only true God. And tonight we exalt your name, Jesus. We exalt Exalt you, Jesus. Let your spirit reign upon every musician and every singer tonight as they glorify you, Jesus. Lord, let your anointing come through your word, Lord, tonight through Brother Abrego. Let your spirit reign through him, Jesus. Open our minds and our hearts, Lord, for what you have in store. Lord, we submit this time unto you, Lord. May your will be done, Jesus. Not our will, but thine be done. We love you, Lord. We exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. God bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, CLC, I wonder if we can worship him tonight. He's been so faithful. He's been so good. He's worthy. Hallelujah, Jesus. We magnify you tonight. At the name of the Lord, every knee will bow. All creation will cry out His greatness And your sons and your daughters are filled with power That is found in the name of Jesus At the name of the Lord we are singing praise For the things that He has done for us Now in faith we unite and we give Him thanks For the good
child's too big for you. So touch me now, touch me now. There's nothing you can't do. There's no one you can't save. No child's too big for you. So touch me now, touch me now. There's nothing you can't do. There's no one you can't save. No child's too big for you. So touch me now, touch me now, there's nothing you can do, there's no one you can save, no child's too big for you. So touch me now, touch me now, I believe the impossible, I receive a miracle, I cling to my healing right now, right We serve an impossible God. What we might see as human beings that's impossible, the Lord sees as possible. 
And tonight you might have a situation that you want the Lord to intervene in, and we invite you to do that right now. On the phone number on your screen, you can call, and there's ministers available to pray with you, or simply as many do, they'll put their prayer requests in the chat, and other brothers and sisters will join together in prayer as the body of Christ. So we're going to go before the Lord for all of your needs right now and for the needs of the body. And also we're going to pray that the Lord will send his righteousness upon our city and upon our nation. Lord, we go before you right now. We ask that you'll touch every situation, every need represented right now in this church and all those that are watching this service right now that have just stumbled upon this service, Lord. It's not by accident that you're here right now watching this service. The Lord wants to touch your situation right now. In Jesus' name, you may have a mountain in front of, a, in front of you that seems impossible, but the Lord wants you to know right now there's hope in him. Jesus, all those that need a healing in their body, we ask right now that you'll touch them. We rebuke cancer right now in Jesus' name. That you'll provide for every need represented in this sanctuary, Jesus, and that are watching right now in Jesus' name, we pray. We ask that your touch will be upon every individual that's watching this service, whether it be right now live or whether it be in archive. Lord, we ask that you'll touch this city. Let your spirit be poured out upon Stockton, California. And may your will be done in this city as it is in heaven. May your will be done in this state as it is in heaven and in this country as it is in heaven. Jesus, right now we speak to the north. We speak to the south, the east and the west. That it must give up the souls that belong to you, Jesus. Lord, for the north, the south, the east and the west of every home listening right now, we ask that your spirit be poured out upon all flesh in these last days. Help us to be the salt and the light to our friends and family and those we come in contact with. And Lord, we ask that you'll touch our elected officials, that you'll touch those that are in, in leadership, Jesus, that they'll be filled with your spirit. Lord, we ask that you'll touch our law enforcement in this city and in this state, that you'll protect them, Lord, and use them for your good. In Jesus' name we pray, let your will be done. Let your protection be upon this ministry and upon us as individuals. Let your healing be upon us right now in Jesus name heal this land we pray heal this land we pray we give it to you right now in Jesus name and we thank you Lord for hearing our prayers thank you Jesus we love you Lord we love you and we trust you right now in Jesus name it's now time for our Wednesday evening tithe and offering God bless you and thank you for your faithfulness Amen. Praise God. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of God. Amen. And it's good to have you tuned in with us today to learn of his word. I'm so grateful to be here this evening and to be gathered together with you in the same mind, in the same spirit, in the same accord to learn of the word of God. I'm so excited for uh, this word that the Lord has placed in my heart to share today because I truly believe that empowerment proceeds revelation of who God is. In other words, when we get to know who God is, we get to know more about him, and we get to know more about 
our position or our orientation towards him, uh, revelation, it, 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 it um, precedes uh, empowerment and the anointing of God, the empowerment of God is increased in our lives as we gain an understanding of who he is. Amen. If you have your Bibles, why don't you open it with me today? And we're going to start today in the book of Hebrews. And we are going to talk about how Jesus is our rest. We know in the Word of God that the Old Testament, uh, many of the prophecies and the law specifically, uh, is what the Apostle Paul describes as a foreshadow of things that are to come. And today we are going to learn about what the Sabbath means and what we can learn about who Jesus is and what our response should be towards Jesus by learning about the Sabbath. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, it reads, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it, which is very important there, that concept of not being mixed with faith. For we who have believed do enter that rest. We believe in what? In the gospel of Jesus Christ. As he has said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. This is speaking of the Sabbath day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it. And those to whom it was first pre preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For, jo for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. With the help of God, I want to uh, unravel here what the word of God means in this passage of scripture. There is so much depth um, in meaning as to who Jesus is when we look at what the Sabbath means for the people of God. First, in the Old Testament, and then what Jesus means as the Sabbath, as he himself is the Sabbath or the rest of the people of God today. Why don't you pray with me and ask that God would enable my heart, my mind, my lips to speak his word and enable us in the spirit to receive what God has for us today. Father, we come before you today, Lord God. We just give you all the honor and all the glory. We give you all the praise, God, tonight. You are worthy of it, Jesus. Your name is the name that is above every other name, Lord Father. I pray, God, that you would be in, God, this message. Lord Father, that you would anoint, Lord, I pray, my lips of clay, God, to release your word. Let it impact us, God, and let it give us a revelation, God, of who you are, God, a deeper understanding, God, of who you are and what you have offered us, God. And also, God, I pray that you would be with us, Lord Jesus, to make us sensitive, Lord Jesus, to your word, sensitive to the commitment that you are calling us to, Father, as we receive you as our rest today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, here in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1, and I'm going to cover all the way through 13. We read all the way till about 10 at first. We read about how Jesus Christ, or the gospel, 
represents a rest, a rest that God had destined to come in the years that were unraveling or in the gospel in the New Testament time. And he, it's directly connected to the Old Testament concept of the Sabbath, which allows us, well, which leads us to understand, to get a proper uh, understanding of what Jesus Christ is supposed to be for us as his rest, as our rest, or as the Sabbath of God that is given to us, we have to understand the roots of what the Sabbath meant for the people of Israel in the Old Testament. We know that the people of Israel, they were a specific group of people that were of the lineage of Abraham. And because they were descendants of Abraham, they had specific promises over their lives because of what God had promised one man, Abraham. And because of that, God was dealing with Israel and he had promised or he had designed for his gospel to be manifested through the people of Israel so that all the nations of the earth, all the Gentiles would be able to partake of a covenant with God. Now, it, this is the context that we're going into here when we begin to study the roots of the Sabbath. Many individuals think that the Sabbath began or was a result of the law. Actually, we, when we read the Word of God, the first Sabbath was practiced before the law of Moses was ever given. And it was practiced for a specific reason and a purpose. It was a purpose of learning. And let's go ahead and go and trace Every mention of a, not every mention, but every conceptual mention of a Sabbath in the Old Testament so we can have an understanding of what Jesus Christ is supposed to mean for us today. If we go to Exodus chapter 16, verses 4 through 5, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day and it was for this purpose that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not and it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in and it will be twice as much as they gather daily hallelujah so in verses 21 through 28 of this same chapter it describes this occurrence that they were to collect what is described as manna that fell from heaven for six days. And the word of God said, do not collect manna on the seventh day because I will give you enough on the sixth day to take you through the seventh day. Also, uh, the, the, uh, the word was that they were not to gather more than what is able to be eaten in one single day for those six days. In other words, when they would collect manna on the first day, they could not collect extra to save for the second day. The Word of God says that that manna, it became useless. It, it, it actually, worms uh, grew out of that manna because, or in, in light of individuals, who attempted to save the manna from one day for another. There was only one day that was supposed to be blessed. One day of gathering that was going to be blessed with an increase that would take them through two days. And that was what individuals would gather on the sixth day. The Word of God says, in verse, And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what will you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded and it did not stink nor were there any worms in it. Then, then Moses said, eat that today, 
for today is Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? God was giving them commandments. He was giving them expectations uh, that they would gather six days. And he was testing them because this was as a result of their complaining to God. They complained to God before God gave them manna and said, oh, that we were back in Egypt and we had food out there in Egypt. And he said, why did God bring us out here into the desert? Did he bring us here into the desert just to die? They questioned and they complained against God. And so God, he released manna from heaven and he was testing them here and he was testing their hearts and their minds but they refused to believe that God was able to supply for their need supernaturally and they and there was still amongst them even after six days of gathering this bread that would fall from heaven there was still people amongst them that went out on the seventh day unbelieving not believing that God would allow what they gathered on the sixth day to be enough for them enough to carry them through the seventh day so we see here in the Word of God that this first Sabbath, this first Sabbath that was required of the people of God, this Sabbath was to be a testimony of God's ability to provide for the needs of His people. This Sabbath was to commemorate or to honor the fact that God was enough. He was enough to supply the need of his people we see here if we continue on that God continues to incorporate this into what we call the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 we see here uh, in in the Ten Commandments verse 8 through 11 remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days you shall labor and do all your work but the seventh day is the day of the Lord your God, the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is in within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Wow. So, the Word of God says here, when He incorporates this, incorporates this Sabbath commemorating, this Sabbath commandment into the Ten Commandments and into the law, what we, we would call the law of Moses, he said in he says in this one something that's a little bit different than what was expressed in Exodus chapter 16 because in Exodus chapter 16 what God was testing was whether they believed that God would supply for their need now here in the 10 commandments we see that for them to keep the sabbath for them to work for six days and rest on the seventh they were supposed to be a reflection of what God did in creation and this is found in Genesis how God worked for six days in other words God he brought things into being that did not exist he brought the light into being he brought the sun and the moon into being he brought the ocean into being the animals of the earth and the plants of the earth he for six days he spoke life and he spoke creation into the world and life came out of nothing and he did this for six days and he rested on the seventh now what we must understand here is that the truth is is that God is an inexhaustible God he is a God that does not get 
tired. He's a God that does not get weary. So we do not, when we read here and we see that God worked for seven day, six days and he rested on the seventh, it's not because he was tired. It's not because he exhausted all of his energy, but it was because he was creating a model. He was creating something that was foreshadowing another thing that was to come into the future. And the word of God says that he worked for six and he rested on the seventh. It was also a testimony to the fact that all of the work that God did in six days was enough. It was enough. There was nothing more that God had to create on the seventh day. It was a testimony that when God does something when he does a work he does it right and he doesn't have to amend the work he doesn't have to change the work he doesn't have to revise the work you see we live in a world that is in constant need of updating and revising if you have a computer you know that the computer revises and that computer updates right now we're using some amazing cameras to record this service but the truth is is that these cameras were the product of uh, they were needed because uh, our system needed updating we had purchased something in years past uh, that was not enough to carry us into where we needed to go your computer needs updating everything that you have needs updating your home needs updating if you got termites you need to you need to smog them out you need to smoke them out uh, if you if, if your your house is not going to last forever everything needs reinforcement uh, and it needs to be changed and revised uh, but the one thing that does not need revision or changing or adaptation is the word of God because when God speaks it it is enough it is enough in all that he does he does good enough for all of time hallelujah the word of God says that from the beginning he established the universe and it continues to this day he sustains the universe by the power of of his word hallelujah uh, I don't know about you but that it makes me excited to serve a God that only needs to speak one time hallelujah he only has to speak one time and it is done and it is enough uh, I praise you God today I praise you God for that power that you speak into our lives today hallelujah so we see here in the commandments, uh, in, in the Ten Commandments, that God, that our, that the people of Israel keeping the Sabbath and resting on the seventh day was a reflection of God's, and it was a testimony, a celebrating of God's creative ability, his ability to work and do enough, right? So now in Deuteronomy, we see that in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12 through 15, we see a reiteration of the law that was given in Exodus. Because in Deuteronomy, they were at a point to enter into the promised land. And the word of God had always described the promised land as a place of rest. A place of rest. So God gave them a reiteration of the law that was in harmony with what was given in Exodus. But we see in Deuteronomy that God adds another reason for the Sabbath. Let's read it here. It says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as you as well. And it says here in verse 15, and remember... That you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Hallelujah. And the Lord your God 
brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you, hallelujah, to keep the Sabbath day. Now, we see another reason why they need to keep the Sabbath day. The first was to trust in God's provisions that he is enough to provide. The second was to remember God's ability to speak into creation and make it come about. And this third purpose here was to recognize that God was enough to set them free from their slavery and their bondage in Egypt. In Egypt, they were bound to work and not prosper and not be blessed and not flourish. They were working for other people and for the benefit of another people. Everything that they would do every day as slaves in Egypt was to bless another. They would work day after day and nothing would be included in their increase because they were owned by the Egyptians. And the word of God says here, look. Uh, remember the Sabbath. Why? Because on the Sabbath, uh, this is a testimony that I was able to set you free with a mighty hand. And I was able with an outstretched arm to save you. Therefore, keep the Sabbath. Wow. This is very powerful. It gives us in here, in these passages that we have read, uh, we see uh, the depth of the motivation that should have been behind the people of Israel. It should have been behind their motivation to keep the Sabbath. Now, uh, the Sabbath day is not the only Sabbath that is described in Scripture. We also see within Scripture a Sabbath of years. This is very important because there is more to be said when we talk about the Sabbath of years. We see in Leviticus here, chapter 25, verses 1 through 5, and the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Wow. So now notice, it is not only they that on the seventh day they were supposed to keep a Sabbath, but the land itself was supposed to keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. This is interesting here. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your unintended, untended vine. For it is a, a year of rest for the land and the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired man and the stranger who dwells with you. The word of God says in verse 20, and if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce, then I will command my blessing. Let me say that again. He says, then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year and it will bring forth produce enough for three years and you shall sow in the eighth year and eat old produce until the ninth year until its produce comes in you shall eat of the old harvest wow so the word of god is talking about here a sabbath of years not just a sabbath of days but a sabbath of years, which means for six years when they entered into the land of the Israel, the actual land, which at that time was called Canaan, and they inherited that land, they were to work for six years, for six years sowing and reaping. However, on the seventh year, they were not to sow into the ground. They were not to reap from the ground. They were not to take of the fruit 
that was going to be given in the seventh year, but they were to allow the fruit to fall to the ground. And the Word of God says, God tells the people of Israel, look, I am going to command, hallelujah, He is going to release His Word to the ground on the sixth year. That on the sixth year, it would give them three times as much. They would be blessed three times as much on the sixth year. And it would be enough to carry them through the seventh e year. Even to the point that on the eighth year, they would still be eating of what they gained on the sixth year. I don't know about you, but that takes a lot of faith. Hallelujah. It takes a lot of faith to be able to believe in God. What, if God told you to work for six years and told you on the seventh year, you're going to take a rain check. You're not going to work for a whole year. And you're simply going to trust in me that I am going to provide for you for one whole year. You're not going to buy and sell. You're not going to go out there and reap of the fruit of the ground. But you're just going to trust that I am enough to carry you through a whole year of not working, of unemployment, so to speak, that God would be enough to bless them. This is the Sabbath of years. Also, we see in Scripture a Sabbath of weeks. In other words, seven weeks. Uh, in, in the word, this is described as the Jubilee, the year of Jubilee. What this means is it is seven years. Uh, uh, seven, um, seven of seven years. A Sabbath of seven years, which totals 49 years. The Word of God says that after the 49th year, in Leviticus 25, 8 through 10, that, that they were to set all of the captives free, all of the slaves free, and they were to forgive all debts at that point in time. And it's the Word of God says here, then you shall cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty hallelujah and that's very important that they were to proclaim right they were not to keep it secret they were not to withhold the information they were to make it known to everyone spread it throughout the land Sound the trumpet and let everybody know. Knock on doors and go spread the news uh, that this is the year of liberty. This is the year of freedom. All debts are going to be forgiven. And if you had to sell your land to be able to survive, the Word of God says that all land would return to its original owner. This is the year of Jubilee. And the Word of God says that they were to proclaim this liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. In other words, the, the, everything was to come back to its original order, back to the original design. If you were born in a family, you were to return to that family. If you had to travel to another place to work uh, because you were in debt, then your debt would be forgiven and you would be allowed to return to your home country, your home city, your home from which you originated. Things were brought back into order and this was meant to be. Now, notice here that when it talks about the Sabbath of years, uh, Sabbath years, uh, at, on the, after the 49th year, this is the only day or this is the only time period where God required them to actively proclaim, to ab actively shout out and spread the news Something is happening this year. Something is happening at this point in time. The favor of God is on every single inhabitant, and God is forgiving all the debts, and we are forgiving all of the debts. Now, 
now that we've gone into the various forms of that Sabbath was uh, uh, practiced in the Old Testament, now let's continue on to the New Testament. Because the Word of God says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow which means that they're something that is only a foretelling of what is of things that are to come, but the substance is of Christ. In other words, uh, that there is a substance that is giving off a shadow in the Old Testament, uh, and that substance and that being is Jesus Christ. Uh, When we look at the shadow of an individual, when we look at the dark outline of an individual we know that though it is the shape of a person that in itself is not the person our shadows are not us you can't kill me by killing a shadow you can't hurt me by by stepping on my shadow because my shadow is only there because of something real that is giving off the shadow i am giving off my shadow but the shadow is not the actual substance of the being so when the word of god says in colossians uh, that the sabbaths were a shadow of those things that were to come which substance is christ uh, that means that the point of the old testament commandments and the scripture is not the literal reading of that but it was pointing to something greater something of substance Uh, we are to learn of that substance uh, by understanding what the shadow is talking about hallelujah so this is the reason why hallelujah in Luke chapter 4 verses 18 through 19 when the Lord Jesus Christ was inaugurating his ministry he proclaims this very important prophecy from the book of Isaiah the word of God says that he went Jesus, he stepped into a synagogue and he, they opened up the scroll of Isaiah. He opened up the scroll of Isaiah to read from it and he read this passage in front of all the people that were gathered in the synagogue. Jesus read this, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Hallelujah. This is a very important uh, message here because it says to preach the gospel simply means to proclaim the news, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty. Hallelujah. That's what the word of God says, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Hallelujah. What is the Lord Jesus Christ talking about? He is actually reaching back into the Old Testament and he's speaking about the Sabbath year and also about the year of Jubilee in which they were to proclaim and shout out loud something different is happening this year. It is the year of forgiveness of debts. It is the year that the captives are to be set free and when Jesus Christ came and he proclaimed this in the synagogue the word of God says that Jesus proclaimed that day this day this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears in other words Jesus was saying you know those things that were foreshadowed in the past This day I am telling you it is being fulfilled through my life. And in this time, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the year of favor. This is the year of being set 
free. Now, Jesus, we know that at this point in time, he wasn't simply talking about monetary debts. He wasn't talking about physical shackles because the truth is, is there are physical shackles that I would rather have before having shackles in the spirit or in my soul. Hallelujah. There are shackles that come on individuals in their soul, whether it be through depression, whether it be shackles of sin, whether it be shackles of any kind of habit that drives them to destructive behavior that are more powerful than any physical shackle could do. This is why our prison system today is not working because it is not enough to just take a person who has transgressed against society and stick them in a jail cell and expect that once they get out they are somehow rehabilitated and transformed. What we need in the world today day is a revival of an understanding of who Jesus Christ is because he can do what no man can do. If they stick you in a jail, you're going to end up the same coming out. But if you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you receive the Holy Ghost, things change. Things are transformed. It is the word of God released into your life saying, be set free be set free from your captivity i don't know about you but i've been set free and i'm glad about it hallelujah i'm so grateful that god was merciful enough called obo shata to speak into my life one day and say be set free hallelujah Ooh, if you've been set free right now, why don't you just lift your hands and thank the Lord? Why don't you lift your hands and worship him? Because he didn't have to, and we sure didn't deserve it. But just like God set Israel free from Egypt without them deserving it, he has set us free from our captivity, from our sin. God, we love you. We praise you for it, God. We worship you for it, God. We could not do it ourselves. We could not do it by ourselves. But you were enough. I thank you today. I thank you today. Now, this is not just some random occurrence. But God, he made sure to prophesy or to give his word to people of old. In viewing this time that was going to be inaugurated by Jesus Christ, which is God himself manifested in the flesh. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, we are talking about hundreds of years before Jesus Christ is even on the scene. We see that Daniel in chapter 9, verse 24, that the word of God speaks of 70 weeks that are determined upon the people of Israel that the transgression would be finished to make an end of sins. And it says here, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. What this means is that the word of God was saying that a, a, that a Sabbath of 70 years, in other words, 490 years after a point in time the Messiah would come and at that point in time he would proclaim a season a season of being set free a, the acceptable year of the Lord so that he can make reconciliation of iniquity in other words make my sin right and bring about in the life of sinners righteousness and holiness unto the Lord hallelujah so Jesus Christ himself, uh, he was uh, the fulfillment uh, of what was being foreshadowed uh, by the law and what was being foreshadowed uh, in the Old Testament. Now, just to wrap things up here, I want to return to Hebrews chapter 4 because now we have the appropriate approach to understanding what Hebrews is trying to tell us about who Jesus Christ is and what our response should be 
to Jesus Christ. Uh, let's read this again. The Word of God says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering His rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Short of the rest. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to, de to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. In other words, they themselves did not enter into the rest. The rest that God was intending them to enter into. Because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who, believe, who have believed do enter that rest. We believe in what? We believe in the gospel or the good news that was proclaimed to us. We believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and as he said, this is God speaking to Israel. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Hallelujah. This is what God spoke over the people of Israel. Why? Because they refused to believe what God could be for them and what God could do through them. We see that this is actually quoting in Hebrews, Psalms 95, verses 10 through 11, where it says, For 40 years I was grieved with that generation. This is God speaking to Israel. And said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my way, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. In other words, because they did not believe who I was and because they did not accept what I could be for them, I refused to allow them to enter into the rest that they were supposed to get in the land of Canaan, in the land of Israel. And it was because of their disobedience, both in mind, in heart, and in action. They did not respond, in other words, uh, to the gospel of their day. They did not respond uh, to the good news of God that set them free from Egypt on their day. But they continued to doubt uh, that the message of God and the revelation of God and the provisions of God were good enough uh, to give them what they needed uh, in the land uh, that they were inheriting. So the word of God says in verse 7, again, he designates a certain day saying in David today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, this is the response that we should have. Do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Uh, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest, which is God's rest, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from us. What does this mean? This means that anyone who has come into believing the gospel and has responded to the gospel, they have accepted the forgiveness of sins by being baptized in Jesus' name. They have been born again in the Spirit by being filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. They have entered into a rest. And here he relates it to the very motive in the Sabbath of the Old Testament, he says that just like God rested on the seventh day, those of us who have accepted the gospel, we enter into our rest. What does this mean? This means that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, this means that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the work that was done, done in Calvary was good enough to save the world and it was good enough to save you and me. It means that we don't need any more work. We don't need any more things to to, nothing else is required. There's no other animal sacrifices that are required. Neither is it required for us to keep 
festivals and feasts and days and Sabbaths, but because this was all pointing to Jesus Christ. When we accept our Lord, when we respond to the gospel, when we come into covenant with Him through baptism and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, we enter into a relationship with a God that is good enough to supply our every need. To save us. To set us free. And so now we have a proper understanding of what it means for Jesus to be our Sabbath. This means that the very same motivations that God expected behind the fulfilling of the law in the Old Testament, they apply to Jesus himself. Let me remind you of what that means. In Exodus chapter 16, to keep the Sabbath meant to believe that God was enough to provide for your need. On a basic level, he was enough to give you food, to provide for you, to let you live. He was enough. In Exodus chapter 20, it was also a declaration that you believed that God's power was enough because he worked for seven days and did not have to work anymore. But what God was giving through his work was enough for us. And it is a declaration or an experience of the grace of God that we did not earn, or in other words, it, was, it, it is a proclamation of believing that God was enough by his mighty hand to set us free from our sin, just like Egypt was set free, just like Israel was set free, free from Egypt. Hallelujah. This is what Jesus Christ should mean to us. He is enough and when we come to him and when we pray to him and when we worship him and when we serve him and when we live for him we need to live every day believing that Jesus Christ is enough to supply for our every need whether it be physical or it be spiritual when we run to someone for rest or we run to something for rest we need to run to Jesus Christ believing that he is going to supply and he is going to give and he is going to set free and he is going to heal because he is enough because his word is enough now in conclusion and this The last few verses here in Hebrews chapter 4 that I'm going to read. When I read these verses, understanding that they applied actually to our responsibility and our response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it really convicted my spirit. Because in Hebrews, what we have read thus far is Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 through 10. But if we continue on to verses 11 through 13, we see something very interesting, very powerful, and very convicting. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. In other words, we have a responsibility to enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that we need more or another crucifixion or another sacrifice from Jesus. It means that we need to live our every day like we believe that Jesus Christ is our everything. It's so easy to get distracted by the things of this world and pursue other methods of resting in our spirits, of healing the wounds in our soul, of soothing our loneliness, of soothing our depression, 
of soothing or trying to be set free from habits that we know are not godly. This world is full of earthly methods. And the entertainment industry, industry is built upon this very notion of giving people options to escape from the reality of their laborious life, the reality of their day-to-day -day work, the reality of their frustrations. So they hide in video games. So they hide in movies. So they hide in books. They hide in human works to try. And all that's happening is that Satan wants to He's attempting by some fashion to emulate the thing that can only be provided by the Spirit of God and by the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what is being said here is that we, those who already know of Jesus, we have to be diligent to keep entering into that rest. We need to keep going back to the Lord Jesus because the truth is it is easier to put on or to read a book than it is to go to prayer. It's easier to seek some type of entertainment because it's so quick. It's so immediate. You can get to it right away. It's so much easier to run to all these other things in the world than it is to come to the prayer room and spend some time with God and give your burden to God and rest in God. One feeds the flesh, but the other feeds the spirit. And we have to be diligent to leave Jesus Christ in the place that he deserves to be. Our only resource for strength, our only resource for joy, our only resource for for love, our only resource for peace. He is our all in all. He is not just the most important thing. He is my everything. He is everything to me. He is the food that I eat like manna. He is the provision that I need for my etalobosha. He is my provision that I need for my every day. He is the rest that I need at the end of my echo. Abasiki yolobo shatala. He is everything that we need. He is everything to us. He's the very ground that we walk on. He set a, He brought us out of the miry clay. He set us on a solid ground. He is my stability. He is my rock. He is my breath of fresh air in the morning. He is the sunshine of my day day. Hey, hallelujah. He is my joy and the joy of my salvation. I don't know if he means that for anybody who's listening to the sound of my voice today, but if he is, I just feel like praising him. I just feel like worshiping the Lord. I feel like recognizing him for his goodness and all that he is for us, for his people. I love you, God. I worship you, God. I will not forget God. Hey, call the basa. I will not forget that you are my everything, God. You're not just the most, you're not my favorite flavor. You are my very desire, the very food, hey, that I need to survive. I can't make it without you. You're my provider. You're my sustainer. You are my joy. And I want joy from no other. But if it's not through you, God, I want my joy and my peace to come through you and only you, my God and my everything. The Word of God says in verse 11, once again, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. What example? The example of Israel back in the Old Testament that refused to believe that God was good enough. Now, as the praise team comes this evening, in verse 12, we read a very notable verse of Scripture that, as it stands alone, is powerful. And it gives us some insight about the Word of God. 
But within the context of this chapter, it is actually talking about something specific that we can miss if we do not contextualize it with what God is trying to tell us in the full passage. Now let me read it again. Verse 11, we'll continue to 12. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, a eh, even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. What does this mean? That the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. And that the word of God pierces even to the soul and the spirit. That the word of God discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart in this passage of Scripture means that God knows we cannot hide from Him that we are not running to Him for rest. In this passage, it means that God knows when we are not going to Him for our spiritual rest. We can't hide it from Him. He sees us attempting human paths to getting rest in our hearts, in our minds, in our emotions. I hope I'm talking to somebody today. In our spirits. God knows. He knows. In this context, it's talking about we cannot hide anything from Him. And we have a responsibility that when we are weary in our spirits, when we are weary in our souls, when we are tired, we are burdened, God knows what we're running to. And all that He desires is that we run to Him, is that we run to His name, because it's the name of the Lord that is a strong tower. Hallelujah. When we're in a time of trouble, it is His name that we can call on. It is when we have ailments in our body, it is His name that brings healing. When we are burdened in our spirits, in our souls, uh, it is by His Spirit that we find strength, encouragement, and empowerment. And in this, He is our all in our all. And my question for the people of God today, for the church of the living God today, is this. Are we making Jesus our rest today? Or are we looking for all kinds of different human attempts. You can be doing this with your family, with your job, and anything that replaces Jesus in your life. God knows. He sees. <laughs> and you know, this is not even for God's good as much as it's for my own good. <laughs> this is why this statement resonates so deeply that God is better to us than we can even be to our own selves. It's for our own good. It's for our own sake. It's for the health of our own mind that we run to Jesus in the time of need. That we run to Jesus when we need a helping hand. That we run to His Spirit. We run to His presence. We run to prayer. We run to our relationship with Him when we feel the weariness of our souls. The next time I come here on a Wednesday night, I'll be talking about the God who carries our burdens. But today, I just want us to reflect on this. Are we making Jesus our all in all? Is He your rest today? 
And if you've been seeking and pursuing any other way, I invite you today. Why don't you try Jesus tonight? Hallelujah. Why don't you try his spirit? Why don't you try his name? Why don't you try praying to him? Why don't you try having a relationship with God today? You won't regret it. You won't regret it because God, he's going to minister to you. He's going to bless you. He's going to empower you. He's going to strengthen you. In the name of Jesus. Lord, do it today. Descend right now, God, on your people, Lord Father. There is somebody out there right now who is lifting their hands to you. There is somebody, God, who is running to you right now. There is somebody, God, who is running to your spirit, God. They've been trying other things that hasn't worked, God. But they're running to you today, God. I pray, God, that you would pour out your spirit. Pour out your power. Pour out your presence. Pour out your rest, God. Because you're not looking for us to keep an actual Sabbath day. But you're looking for us to run to you who, are our, who is our rest today. Pour out your spirit and your presence tonight, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.